Tear gas stings the throat, it burns the eyes. Just kept firing, 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 firing. I think that they might be using a little excessive force. Had several people flooding the streets, um, been blocking traffic. I just kept thinking to myself, like, that would never happen in Fort Wayne. Protest is good when it's done properly, but to destroy the place you live and hurt the people that are trying to take care of you is not the means and method that we should be doing it. The conversation uh, took off, and it, it was a, a good conversation, according to the officers, and so I was very positive. And those positive conversations are what we are building on tonight. Good evening. Thanks for joining us for Focus 15 Police and the Community. I'm Tara Brantley. And I'm Dirk Rowley. It was nearly a year ago that the world, including Fort Wayne, observed and protested against the death of George Floyd. The city saw a demonstration shortly after former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin held his knee on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes during an arrest in Minnesota. Residents took to the street in various cities across northeast Indiana, including Fort Wayne, and some turned violent with demonstrators and police officers not getting along too well. Now we want to see what progress has been made, and we want to see what can be done to better the relationship between police and the community. Take a look. We have gathered five panelists from a wide variety of backgrounds. Let's introduce them to you now. We start right out of the gate with the man who has led the city of Fort Wayne since 2008. We welcome Mayor Tom Henry. Police Chief Steve Reed declined our invitation due to ongoing litigation against the city. Current Fort Wayne City Councilwoman at large, Michelle Chambers, is also the uh, co-leader of the Mayor's Commission of Police Reform and Racial Justice. Again, welcome Michelle Chambers. Another member of that commission is Allen County's Chief Deputy Prosecutor Michael McAlexander. Allen County Sheriff since 2014, Sheriff David Gladio. And a member of the Indiana Advisory Committee of the United States Commission on Civil Rights and senior pastor of Imani Baptist Temple, Reverend Bill McGill. We want to welcome all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you for being here. Again, we also want to hear from you tonight. Definitely. Wayne 15's Chris Darby is our social media monitor and has a number of ways you can join our conversation. Chris. Hey guys. This is a conversation that's important for our community, and because of that, we want everyone to be involved who can be. I'll be following along with the hashtag Focus15 on Twitter and Facebook. We want to work in as many questions as we can tonight as time allows. All right, Chris, thank you. Now, to be clear, Wayne 15 was in extensive conversations with the Change Makers organization who were part of the initial protests. So they originally agreed to take part here tonight, but then about four hours ago, they declined. I want to get this wording right. The organizer sent us an email that said, quote, uh, after much consideration, and some back and forth feelings. Things are just not going to align well in order for us to participate in this panel. So our very first question for our panelists comes from that very fact. What is your reaction to the fact that they aren't here, that apparently the trust between the city, police, is so broken between those agencies and some of its citizens? Your thoughts? Well, I, I don't know if it's broken. I think that uh, there is still some anxiety, uh, some stress uh, that remains uh, among the groups. Uh, and it's unfortunate that they uh, we, uh, did not want to join us this evening in this discussion because I would have liked to have heard what they had to say in response to some of the actions that we've taken trying to address uh, the, uh, the situation that occurred uh, last summer. I'd have to say disappointed uh, that they didn't. Uh, show up tonight because uh, for those same reasons um, we had we had good open dialogue which is what we should be doing and uh, I thought it was going real well everything was fine uh, uh, the the demonstration or protest if you will I think went went off without a hitch right up until it didn't um, and I think it's no fault of theirs uh, in my personal opinion I think that uh, they were infiltrated uh, by outsiders that wanted uh, to send a different message. And I think uh, it just evolved from there. And it, it honestly would have been nice for, uh, to have them here tonight to, to at least share that with them. That I, I never once thought that the group that I watched demonstrate 
that Saturday uh, until about three o'clock. I never thought that they were involved in, in any of what erupted then later on. Yeah, I think there, more, more than anything, I certainly can understand their, their <clears throat> frustration, if you will. Um, by their own admission, they're new to this organized uh, sense of struggle. Um, but I think it's important for them to realize that you've got to have uh, ongoing conversations if you're going to see transformation. And I know that uh, someone that I said in another sitting the other day, uh, I've been talking about this uh, for nearly half a century now. I'm having laryngitis uh, because we've been here before. Uh, we've had talks, we've had conversations, whether in this community or other communities around the nation. And yet America is, is still stuck almost in another generation, another era. And so I'm sure that there were parts of them uh, that felt like this might just be some idle chatter, uh, that really their concerns don't matter. But you've already got to be at the table uh, at the end of the day. And so I would encourage them, um, as those of us that have been working for civil rights for such a long time, we want someone to pass the baton to. And being a part of the conversation, being at the table, is the only way we're going to move uh, America over from its uh, equality fable. You know, America talks a good talk but walks a very poor walk. Uh, but they've got to maintain their connectedness to the system if we're going, ever going to see a change. So I would, I would hope that another opportunity that they'll certainly participate. Speaking of connectedness, a short time after the protests last year, the city held a unity march, a unity rally. Mm -hmm. um, this viewer tweeted asking, was the unity march a publicity stunt? Well, I was a part of that walk. And uh, it certainly was not a publicity stunt. Uh, first of all, change makers and the other organizations asked me to be involved with them uh, to show unity. And we marched to the Dr. Martin Luther King Bridge together. In fact, we were arm in arm to show that we were, in fact, trying to put uh, a lot of this behind us and move forward rather than reflect on what had happened previously. And I think it's tough. Uh, Mr. Mayor, with all, with all honesty, um, I think people can interpret those kinds of things because for whatever reason, we only come together in yeah, tragedy. Yeah, um, and, and, and so we, we've just got to do a better job. Marion Wright Andelman, I was thinking about that earlier today, she said, and I'm sure it's a quote that Councilwoman Chambers knows, she says, at the end of the day, it is utterly draining. <laughs> I mean, it's a life of angst, first of all, to just approach America as an African-American. And so you add to that then the disconnect between law enforcement agencies, uh, periodically the prosecutor's office, so that I think we have to do a better job then of, of sitting down together, uh, perhaps maybe quarterly, just before things happen. Uh, and then we'll be able to talk with integrity and intensity when things do happen. Mr. McGowan. I, th I think there's also a lot of misunderstanding, misinformation, or a lack of understanding of how government works, how our institutions uh, work together. And there's been so much um, assumptions made by a lot of uh, the protesters. I know when they came to Karen Richards' house last summer and were kind of yelling at us on one hand and asking us questions, there wasn't a real willingness sometimes to listen to the answers. And it, we weren't trying to spin things. It's just a matter of education. Uh, and I certainly <clears throat> understand the legal system can be confusing on the best of days. Uh, but they're just things that we have to rely on other parts of the institution. Some of the demands that have been made were things that only city council could do or the uh, state legislature could do. It wasn't that anyone, uh, the mayor or the sheriff or the prosecutor, had a magic wand that they could suddenly make these changes. Mm -hmm. And some of them were, just showed a lack of understanding. So it's disappointing that people aren't here tonight because I think when we talk about this stuff and we explain how the system works and how you change the system, that is what I think we all ultimately want is a better system. I, I think that, uh, quite frankly, what happened uh, roughly a year ago, uh, I firmly believe that it was not all about George Floyd. I think that brought to, to light a lot of other concerns mm -hmm. 
in the primarily in the black community in Fort Wayne, uh, because as we began to talk more and more, and I think you experienced a lot of this with the commission, a lot more came out. A lot of frustration and anxiety and, mm -hmm. and angst came out because many of them felt that our community and quite frankly society as a whole had failed them along the way in a number of areas that uh, we kind of pushed away and did not bring into the open. Uh, this gave them the opportunity to bring that forward. So I. I think that day consisted of a lot more than just protesting the death of George Floyd. Okay, now we have another question, um, segueing right out of that, closely tied. Councilwoman Chambers, you launched the Police Commission on Police Reform and Racial Justice. Did that accomplish anything from a year ago? Yeah, I believe that the, the commission has and will accomplish a, a lot of things, as mm -hmm. the mayor has indicated. A lot of things have come forward that are greater and beyond the death of Mr. Floyd, mm -hmm. that we have our own institutional situations that we need to deal with as a police force and the representation of our police force, how the police force interacts with the community. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just so much about um, Mr. Floyd's death, but it was about our constituents here who have had less than desirable interactions with our police department. Um, that day, the protest, uh, the riots, the next day, um, you know, it wasn't always a good visual for the protesters who were tear gassed. I think there was opportunity for the protesters to learn as well as how police force handles a civil unrest as this was our first civil unrest here in Fort Wayne. So everybody were, they have been in new territories, but the commission worked really hard over the last year. We had some really tough, direct conversations. We came out of there with 44 recommendations. Uh, we'll be meeting, we've met with the mayor already with how the police department will respond to those, but we still have a lot on the table to deal with. Can I ask you what mm -hmm. are just one of those 44? One of the, it's diversifying the police force. Okay. You know, retraining the police force how to deal with situations such as that we experienced on the 6th. When I left downtown that, that evening, I was Fort Wayne proud. People were out there protesting, voicing their concerns mm -hmm. and everything. By midnight, chaos. Next day, we got tear gas. Um, I, I remember what I'm going to always remember about the next day downtown. I'm, I'm, I have an office, the courthouse. All sheriff cars surrounding the courthouse, sheriff's walking dogs, all white men, and a group of pastors out in the, in the way praying. I said, is this 1968? What is going on? So there are absolute lessons that we have to deal with the reality that we are at times a divided city and policing in our city is not perfect it is not bad but it's not perfect and there are a lot of lessons from that 48 hours 72 hours that we're still learning today mm -hmm. all right let's uh let's change topics slightly uh this question comes to us from facebook will officers with excessive force charges be fired now, I start with the deputy prosecutor here. Technically, I don't believe any of the officers were even charged with excessive force, correct? Uh, no, I don't believe so. We had uh, people reviewing, I, I think we had four people reviewing for six to eight weeks the video from various things. Uh, there were some instances that were disturbing that we forwarded back to the department. Um, but there was a lot of it that obviously in tactical gear, it's hard to identify people and uh, find complainants as well and witnesses. So, uh, but we did a very thorough review on that. And I, and I think to that, Derek, and again, um, and I count all of these folks on the stage uh, as friends and colleagues, I really do. Uh, but that's an example, again, because the language begins to be up for interpretation. So it was not excessive, but it may have been disturbing. <laughs> and again, to lay people, there's not much difference mm -hmm. between the two. You know, to say, well, if it was disturbing, then it probably was excessive. And so we have to, again, and that's the difficult thing in Fort Wayne. That's just historical. It takes an awful lot to get rid of a police officer. Uh, individuals can have more than you know, a dozen complaints about any number of things that have been identified. 
And we have just a very strong union that will not stand up. We want to talk about George Floyd. What happened in Minneapolis with police officers crossing that blue line and saying that that was not acceptable behavior to this day, I'm not aware that that has ever happened in our community. There has been no identification of heinous officers. I often say that we only probably have three or four officers that I can't wait to get, get fired or, or, <laughs> or retired because fundamentally we have a welcoming, responsive mm -hmm. community approach to policing. But the problem is that we've got a few rogue officers that the union continues to support and things are going to have to change if we're really going to have a successful report. But I guess from a sense of choosing who to prosecute and who not, uh, if I'm a protester, I feel like I was maybe blocking a street, certainly not doing anything violent. And some of the images that we see, with, like you said, were disturbing. And it feels like, well, they were wearing a mask or we could, I couldn't identify them. It feels like you're not quite as dogged in pursuit of, of that. And is that two systems or is that just... Well, well I, think, what is it? I think from the criminal standpoint, I've prosecuted several police officers over the years, uh, and usually the result has been to remove them from the force. Uh, frequently, I've included that in a plea agreement uh, as part of the um, punishment, if you will. Uh, but one of the things that came out of this was the necessity to have actual facts and witnesses. Uh, we function in a court system that we have to present evidence. So I have to have witnesses that can say, I saw this person doing this at this time. Uh, it's not as simple as just seeing somebody slug somebody. There can also be context. Uh, no matter how much video you have, I also always point out, look at an NFL football game. How many views of a catch do we see before a determination is made? Uh, and we're going to have that problem in the future with body cams. Because once things start going and it gets rough, the body cam's flopping all over the place. So it's a, it's a disturbing image to look at. But it will ultimately help us. And I, I think most jurisdictions have found a combination of some of that protects officers, but it also indicts officers. So um, I think we can do both, but we have to let the system play out. As I recall, you, that's. I think when you made this announcement that there was disturbing things that the, the internal, the police internally need to re look at, uh, that you said that you were open to re-examining any new evidence that would come forward. Would body cameras have helped you identify any officers that did something that you thought may have been approaching the line? Well, I think they probably would because we'd be able to attach that to the body cam of, of an individual officer. So now that we have body cameras, are you going to have anything in addition to that, like special training, sensitivity training? I think the department has been working on that. One of the things that came out of the uh, mayor's commission was our police department, and, and most of the focus obviously was on Fort Wayne, is doing a lot of things and has been doing a lot of things, but people didn't necessarily know about it. I think the commission in many respects uh, has put out some very aspirational um, recommendations to make us even better. But the good thing we found, uh, one of the things was the eight can't wait recommendations from a national group. And I believe we were doing seven out of the eight and the other one that we weren't doing was kind of a matter of interpretation that had to do with, with local practice. We were certainly within the spirit of that. So. There was a lot of things that we're doing right in Fort Wayne, and I think we should be proud of that. But it doesn't mean that it's perfect by any means, and it doesn't mean that we can't improve. And certainly you have individual officers that uh, their personalities, they may be fine people, but they just aren't people persons. And other ones that are very good, and we see evidence of that in a lot of different circumstances. Let's check in now with Wayne 15's Chris Darby for more comments and questions for our panelists. Chris? Yeah. Hey, guys. One of the first tweets we got was from someone named Ian. He said he's witnessed several human rights violations during that weekend of the protest. And that's a term that we've seen time and time again. So my question is, uh, following this, do you consider any of these things to be human rights violations that happen between the police officers and the demonstrators? 
I do not. Um, I think that uh, they're the protesters, and again, I don't, I don't go to the change makers. It, it's the infiltrators that came in and, and riled the troops, if you will. Um, you know, my, my responsibility was, and we'll, we'll go to the cars surrounding the courthouse, um, that was done on purpose and that was done by me, a decision solely by me. And I did that. Uh, we lost, you know, they were, the, the night they were doing the windows and breaking windows, we lost one window, excuse me, two windows in the courthouse. And my job was to protect that courthouse. And that day I did that. We didn't lose any windows. We had no damage done. Uh, so overkill, maybe, in some people's eyes, but the building was safe. <laughs> um, and, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, to, to me it doesn't matter what color of skin the officers had when they were protecting the building, and, and I, I correct you, ma'am, there was uh, a couple African-American uh, officers out there. Um, in fact, Jason Baker, sergeant, stood there for three straight hours. And that's something I really wish the news media would have shown a little more of. They were within an inch of his face for three straight hours, and he stood there and took it and didn't flinch. I called him on the radio and asked him, do you need a break? He turned around and looked at me, and he says, I got this. He turned <laughs> right back around and took it for another hour and a half. So, um, you know, I commend him for that. Um, but as, as, as far as our reaction, and that's exactly what it was, it was a reaction to their action. Um, <clears throat> we did, my, my troops did not react until the, the, the frozen water bottles were thrown. I don't remember hearing any news media talk about frozen water bottles. I, water was thrown on us. Fireworks. Those weren't fireworks. Those were concussion grenades. I know because one landed right next to me. And these things were louder and, uh, than anything that my SWAT team throws into a house. Um, so that was a little unre unreported, in my opinion. Um, so that kind of sets the stage for people thinking we overreacted. And uh, we didn't overreact, in my opinion. Uh, the Allen County Sheriff's Department did. I can't speak for the city of Fort Wayne, and I won't because they, I, in my opinion, they do a fine job. They're under litigation right now, but uh, I'm sure Steve Reed would like to be here to, to, to explain how things went and why they went there. Can you clarify that, though, how that night or when you operate jointly, decisions are made and, and, and police from different agencies are, are positioned or, or, or how that works specifically? at the courthouse those those nights? It was it was previously decided that, that the sheriff's department was going to take care of the county buildings and uh, focusing mostly on the courthouse. And that was our sole responsibility. And I told the chief that. I said I will have my uh, other teams down here ready to react if you if need be. Um, so as far as uh, the tear gas uh, and stinger grenades and things like that that were thrown, that did happen by us as well. Uh, but that only happened after very large rocks were thrown. Uh, I was personally hit. I was standing right there in this intersection as well with them. Uh, the concussion grenades, the frozen water bottles. Uh, uh, so again, it, it was you know, reacted. Uh, to their action. And and let me, I, let me, I think I think this is where again on both sides, <coughs> and I'm just old school <laughs> protest. But I think both sides have to approach these events, not from a tactical, but a practical point of view. And so, years ago, again, I remember when we were protesting uh, what was going on in South Africa. Uh, I flew to Washington, D.C. to be one of the people arrested at the embassy. I had every intention of being arrested. <laughs> it was as simple as that. We approached the, 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 the embassy. We were less than five feet from an embassy. That's a violation of the law. We put our hands behind us and got arrested. 
<laughs> we went going to be arrested. And so I think that if this generation, again, goes back to the principle of Dr. King and Gandhi and others, that you expect there's no need to wear a mask because I want you to know who I am. You know? And I want to take both responsibility and accountability for what I'm doing. And we go down, we stop. We could have stopped traffic by laying in the streets. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you just, that's, but, if, but you go there with the intention to make your point and your presence known. And you remain, you remain a person of principled nonviolence. And so uh, that is what got the conscience of America, uh, because we, again, uh, and the John Lewis's and others of another generation, intentionally violated the law in a non-confrontational way. And so when law enforcement did overreact and overrespond, the protesters were never held accountable <laughs> because it was there for all the world to see that they had been involved in peaceful protest. And again, we'll never know now uh, how things could have gone if right. individuals, again, had just remained disciplined and not allowed their emotions to get uh, the best of them. Clearly, the mayor's right. There was more <laughs> than George Floyd going on that mm -hmm. night. It's 400 years of waiting on America to turn the page and to get on the equality stage. And it comes to a point where people just get tired. Uh, they just get tired and their hopes had begun to be expired. Uh, and I felt their pain, I promise you. And Mayor Kearney, I know the city is in litigation, but are you able to comment? No. Mm -mm. no. Okay. I can't on that. <clears throat> okay. so, so to build to your point, um, I remember many, many, many moon ago when I first came out of the park, uh, during the, the abortion uh, protest. And that's exactly how they handled it back then. They sat in the middle of the street. They got arrested. Nobody broke windows. <clears throat> Nobody threw grenades. Nobody threw, you know. Uh, and I think things have changed quite a bit throughout the years on how we approach voicing our opinion on something. You know, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, you, you know, whether it's a, for a, a, a a justified cause or not. I just, I guess I, I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, things have changed throughout the years on how we do that. Let, let me ask a follow-up question <clears throat> as protesters aren't here. Uh, if they would say that technique, we've tried that technique, you know, how far did it get you? It's time for a new technique. Well, the truth of the matter is it, it got us further than we had prior to that. And I in no way suggest that we're anywhere near where we need to be. There's no denying that. Uh, we are so far, and that's, I think, one of the problems with a city like Fort Wayne is where uh, good becomes the, the enemy of great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're better than, but we keep, you know, uh, defining ourselves by ourselves, you know. Uh, and it, 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 it hinders us from moving uh, the baton just a little further. Um, but what we do know uh, is, again, this generation can't say that they tried it because they haven't. Uh, and so it's a matter of, again, carrying on what Dr. King, John Lewis, again, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, but never again arrested for anything of a violent nature. <clears throat> so you've got to be willing to lay down. Dr. King put it this way. If a man or woman hasn't found anything worth dying for, they're not ready to live. Hmm. It's just not fit to live. So at some point, you have to put flesh in the game. You got to put skin in the game. And uh, I think and, and I know uh, that Gandhi is right. Good travels at a snail's pace. Those that want to do good are not in a hurry. It takes time. I'm resolved now, Madam Councilwoman, that, that not in my lifetime will I see the United States of America. Uh, because I'm, I'm coming to midnight now. <laughs> I joke that I look 35, but I'm 65. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm but, hopeful. But I'm so, hopeful. so I'm, I'm not as hopeful as she. Not in I'm my a decade lifetime. Behind you, so yeah, I not in my yeah, lifetime. I think I might see but you, but so. we have moved the needle right. further than we than our generations before thought. This question comes to us from our reported feature. In hindsight, do you regret the militant language you used in the lead up to the second day of protests? For example verbally threatening the protesters, including lawfully abiding peaceful protesters through the media and warning the media to leave after their initial reporting. I believe that's for you, Sheriff. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. I did say that. And, you know, I, I experienced both nights. And uh, 
I, I, I remember about every five minutes, you turn your head and you see, and, and don't take offense, but well, I saw four of them news people get out of one car and just shoving microphones in front of people's faces and, you know, almost, almost like egging them on. And I understand you have a job to do, and that's great. But when it went from peaceful to not peaceful, in my opinion, and some people will disagree, but I think, I don't want to, you know, I don't mean to say it as the gloves are off, but things change at that point, okay? Not dictated by us, dictated by the protesters. When they changed their tactics, we changed ours. And that's, I, and, and I'm sure some people here might disagree with it, and I'd love to hear how they would approach it. Because, I mean, we, we tried meeting with, I believe there was some ministerial people that tried to meet before the, the, the protests even started, and the protesters wouldn't even entertain the thought. So, I mean, when you're dealing with that, how, how are we supposed to deal with it when it turns into violence? Uh, it certainly didn't turn into violence on our end, in my, <coughs> in my opinion. Any comment for Sheriff Pledio? Let me follow up then on that point. Um, numerous studies, I guess since the 60s, have, have suggested that when police take a more aggressive stance, when they come out with the, the riot gear on, that that does not quell the crowd, that amps them up. Is, is there any, in your and, thought, thinking, is there any correct, is that correct, I guess? And we, we, we learned that on, uh, that would have been Sunday, I believe. Um, I'm getting my days mixed up. But the next day, after the cars were around the courthouse, we did change gears. And we were inside the building, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, that did help. And I'll admit, I don't know that it would have helped the day before because there wasn't anywhere near the people uh, on that, that next day or the next weekend, if I can't, I can't remember if it was the next weekend or, or that Sunday. But uh, there wasn't near as many people. And the out-of-towners were, our intel showed they weren't in town anymore. Yeah. So uh, totally different. I don't think you can compare the two. Okay, let's go back to Chris now with another question from our viewers. Yeah, this is a question we got submitted to us uh, through our report it function as well. But this is kind of shifting gears a little bit from that initial weekend, looking more to the future and solving some of these problems. How is cultural diversity being taught within our police departments here? Me again? <laughs> Funny that, that that's brought up uh, <clears throat> December of last year. I had already uh, made plans to have a company come in and, and start from command staff, the highest all the way down, to go through uh, eight hours of, of training uh, with this company. Every officer on our department did it. I then extended it to our civilian confinement officers as well, because they are in, in, uh, in a setting that, uh, uh, that they, I felt they needed to to learn how to, to handle talking to people, not just uh, looking at them as inmates. And uh, it, it, it's, I had no idea that, that the riots were gonna happen months later, but uh, that, uh, my entire department has gone through it, and, uh, that training, and it's completed. And there is on, ongoing training in the future as well. Do you have a way to measure the difference it's made? Too early to tell now, right now. Um, I will tell you the positive responses we got from the employees was really, really surprising to me. Um, you know, normally you get the, oh, I don't want to go to this training. I don't want to, you know. Uh, we got thank yous, uh, especially from the civilian confinement officers. They, they, they really responded positively. And it, it, it made me feel pretty good got to do something that they wanted and I didn't even realize they wanted it, you know. Um, but uh, it, it all worked out well and it's going to be a continued thing for sure, no doubt. Along Stacey, that this is, Yeah, this is another example of, again, just a few bad actors, you know, because again, 
in the midst of the training, unfortunately, we still had a, a assistant supervisor in the call center, mm -hmm. you know, sending yeah. racist tweets yes. um, that, of course, in my mind, should have been fired, you know, um, that was given a week off. Um, but, but again, so it's, it's individuals when we have an opportunity, and I, I, I promise you, because they, this is the systemic kinds of things, mm -hmm. that African Americans want to feel like they matter. That's all. And so we almost have to make examples when we hear and see and learn of individuals that are not embracing the training, you know, or trying mm -hmm. to grow and stretch themselves, then uh, we have to offer them up as an example of these are the kinds of individuals and attitudes that we won't tolerate. That demonstrates that we really are a welcoming community and trying to move forward. So along that same vein, this question also coming from Reported, it says, have your departments considered having employees, all employees, submit to implicit bias training? Well, we're going through that now with the uh, police department. It's a program that we started through Fort Wayne United uh, several months ago. We've invited a consultant uh, to come and give a series <coughs> of uh, lectures, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's also interactive, and uh, uh, our employees are all asked uh, strongly to, uh, to participate in those. And interestingly enough, uh, most of them wanted it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, emotions and a lot of feelings that people don't quite know how to respond to. Uh, so that's exactly what we're doing is we have a year-long uh, series mm -hmm. uh, that uh, our employees are participating in. All of our division directors have to participate uh, and the department directors as well. But it gets down to line staff. It's voluntary. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, as I mentioned, uh, most of them are, are participating. What's been the feedback thus far? Uh, absolutely positive. As a matter of fact, they had another survey that went out today, okay. uh, which I gladly filled out. Uh, the, uh, and it'll, be, it'll be interesting to get the response. Uh, but we've, uh, how long have we been doing that now? Four or five oh, months? Yeah, about five Four, yeah. yeah, about five months now mm -hmm. and uh, into a year program. And I was also offered to the county as well. I, I think mm -hmm. the commissioners worked <laughs> with the city on that. Mm -hmm. So I know in our office uh, we have many people participating in it. And I think that it's a good thing because it's not only with the city employees, right. you have the school district, the county. So this is taking place throughout the entire city. Mm -hmm. You know, we are doing work that's shifting culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a while for shifts to happen and systemic things to change. It, we didn't get here overnight. But because we're working together collectively as a city and it's all people working and learning together, I believe that it's going to be very impactful, mm -hmm. the training that's taking place right now. So you're trying to change the mindset. You have to change the mindset. I mean, you know, policing in America, the foundationally, um, the foundation that it was built on wasn't the most positive. So as we have evolved here in the great United States of America, our policing has to evolve with it. You know, policing, as you indicated, de-escalation is proven to be a better approach, you know? And I just think that I'll always just say it, we all on both sides have lessons that have been learned and still need to be learned in how we uh, handle and deal with these situations. And unlearned. Oh, unlearned. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Can we, uh, for a moment, just talk about some of the cases that are still out there? I, I had thought until this evening uh, that everything had winded its way through the court system. You're still prosecuting some of these things. Yes, we are. Uh, there were a little over 150 uh, cases brought originally. Uh, most of those were misdemeanors. Uh, I believe at the moment we've had 57 guilty pleas. Uh, 54 cases were dismissed after the investigation and making a determination whether they could or couldn't be proven. Uh, there were four felony cases, uh, two of which have pled guilty and, and been sentenced. Two of them are set for trial. Um, one of them next month. Uh, I think uh, there's three outstanding warrants, 18 people went on pretrial diversion, 13 were referred to juvenile court. Um, so we're getting down to, I think there's five misdemeanor cases still set for trial. Is it true that in Marion County, all the nonviolent 
people, people that were arrested for nonviolent offenses were not prosecuted? I believe the uh, prosecutor there fairly early in the process announced that he was dismissing most of the charges. And, 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 that and I don't know not... how much, um, I don't know if they had charges pending against people who committed acts of vandalism or if he got rid of all the misdemeanor cases. Let's take a moment out to go back to Chris for another question. Yeah, we're seeing the term copaganda quite a bit coming into our feed. How do you kind of penetrate this wall of people who really feel like they're not being included in conversations uh, to be able to make some sort of change? I mean, you, uh, I don't want to say the term propaganda is how they view all of this, but, uh, you know, what can you do to be able to get through to people who really feel like they're trying to make a change but not being heard? Well, I can, I can submit to you again, one of the outsider. I'm an outsider, just have an inside game, because <laughs> I really am. I mean, I'm not attached to anything other than my congregation. But, but in the words of that, that musical Hamilton, so good, I saw it twice. <laughs> I mean, you got to be in the room where it happens, you know, at, at, at the end of the day. And you have to build relationships, that's all. And so, uh, and that only happens by getting in the room. I, I started coming to court every day. That's all, just getting familiarity with the judges, the prosecutors, the chief, having conversations in the hallway, relationship building, so that I think Judge Gold just yesterday referred to me as the conscience of the court. So you can't just show up on certain days, certain things that affect you personally. If you're really going to be committed to change, you got to show up every day mm -hmm. and, and try to build some inside relationship to give individuals another perspective. Even if they don't understand you, just them hearing you on a repeated basis will start creating some measure of change. I promise you, it really does matter. So and speaking of getting in the room, has the city, has the county reached out to the community to try to have these conversations? Um, it's, oh, okay. <laughs> it started with the, the Mayor's Commission on Police Reform and Racial Justice. That, that commission is such a diverse commission. And it ha it go it's a two-way street. We as constituents, we have to be willing to come in partnership to work together and to learn together. You have to start somewhere. So the civil arrest we had here, it grew the Commission on Police Reform and Racial Justice. So we absolutely have to come together and see dis different perspectives, learn from one another, and be open to change, to correct the, the wrongs that may have been done on both sides of the aisle. But as a city, I can speak as a, as a councilwoman, we have been trying to work collectively um, with our concerned citizens. And I'm confident that when we are done reviewing and you know, the response from the Fort Wayne Police Department, you'll see that there's going to be even more community effort to listen and learn and make the community um, more aware of what's going on. I'm not familiar with the terminology, propaganda, whatever that, that was. I just know that as a city, the mayor listened and responded, and we have people that are actively engaged. And, and, and you know, my hat goes off to change makers. They are young people who have evolved through this process, and they're still evolving, and they want to be change makers. Um, some people may not agree with their approaches and how they go, mm -hmm. but they are engaged. They are actively involved, and they are trying. So you say your hat goes off to them. Has the city reached out? To them. Oh yeah, they, they were at our very first meeting. They, they came, we listened. This, this wasn't a, the commission was not a commission for us to sit there and have kumbaya. They came and they talked to us and they really let us know and held us accountable through this whole process. Because if, I don't know if you know that the meetings were filmed, they were put up um, within 48 hours to the, there's the, no editing, they're just raw footage out there of those meetings. So the change makers, they were there on the very first meeting that we had they um, checked in on recommendations and follow-ups and what their expectations, you know, what they would like to see come out of that. So we, they were, it was not a closed-door situation, but COVID changed it. Originally, that, that those meetings would have been open, but, you know, COVID shifted how we meet and how we deal with things, but we still pushed through. We did not let um, COVID stop our efforts. You know, it's going to take the, the public, the city, and everyone that lives here working together to make these cultural shifts that would have to take place in our policing. Because again, I said, we have a wonderful city to live in. We have a wonderful uh, police force, sheriff and, and city. But do we have some areas of growth, of change? Absolutely, we're not perfect. And that's happening in the nation. What's happening to us here in Fort Wayne is not unique to Fort Wayne. It is happening in the nation. 
I don't of think the, that's where that's, that phrase comes from. <clears throat> Copaganda. It's kind of like propaganda. Yeah, I do, so but you know. I think that individuals, <laughs> again, being the outsider, <laughs> I, was, I was literally stunned when the report came out and it was, it was unanimous. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? You know, you've got all of these different people in the room, and there wasn't one thing that you continue to disagree on. And so, again, individuals that are not in the room just, just look at it and go, well, that never, ever happens. It doesn't even happen at the home. A husband mm -hmm. and a wife agreeing. <laughs> so, so it came, the release came, mm -hmm. just being honest, with a little suspect. Mm -hmm. That's all that, well, now, come on. You know, all you have to do is watch the yeah, meeting. There's yeah, no problem. Yeah, but I'm no just problem. saying. But that's, no, no but that's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. That's all. So yeah. I, you know, if, I, if I can interrupt just a moment. Those meetings, uh, you need to watch them to realize what that group went through. Mm -hmm. As Councilwoman Chambers said, uh, it was not a kumbaya <laughs> session. Uh, there were some very argumentative uh, discussions going on. Uh, they, they literally fought verbally uh, to make sure that their point was being heard. Uh, but the beauty of that whole exercise was that they worked hard to ultimately come together to be able to come up with recommendations that were ultimately forwarded to the police chief and myself. And I think there's where I was going to follow up. We haven't heard the response yet. You've turned in this apparently beautiful piece of homework. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been graded yet. When are we going to hear that? That was more than 60 days ago. No, no, we, no, no. no? Chief responded within the 45 days. We <laughs> are in the pro Well, no, you have okay. to you make sure you know the order, That's right? That's what I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> Presented to the public. Mayor stated 45 days. Chief's had it back in 45 days. We are going through those recommendations. June the 3rd, we will have a public presentation to the public. So I just, we, we are within the parameters of everything that we said that we were going to do and deliver. And your initial thoughts on the police? I mean, I, again, I know you're waiting till June 3rd, mm -hmm. but overall, you're, you're, you're not feeling derailed? No. I'm, uh, no. No. I'm not feeling derailed. But remember, the problem is years of distrust. That's all. We'll just not go away. <laughs> right. You know, that, that's all. And, and again, that's, that's, that's okay. You know, that's all. If we go into it with that mindset that, you know, because I thought initially this conversation was a little premature. Mm. Because we're only a year out and we haven't seen any implementation of those different recommendations that we really out of, we haven't had another protest. Well, no, no that's not true. One of the primary recommendations of the commission was for body cameras. Mm -hmm. And not only did we follow uh, council's recommendation to get 100 cameras, we went ahead and outfitted the whole force. So, it, no, no, it was, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's already taken place. Okay. But the general public doesn't know that. Well. Of which I'm a part of. That's all that I'm saying. They, they aren't privy to those things yet. So they will all. be. Okay, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll look forward. <laughs> now, I believe we also have a question that was submitted via video. Let's take a moment to listen to that right now. Hi, I have a question regarding the foreign police. Uh, besides the Blue Bucket Brigade, the Foreign United, Boys and Girls Club, what other type of programs can you instill and come up with in the future so that we can build that trust in the community when it comes to youth um, and then we can get away from fear and that uh, our youth does feel comfortable coming to the police um, when it comes to crimes and any other type of activity. I was just very curious on what we can do to strengthen that and become more engaging um, in several areas in Fort Wayne that we do need a lot of work on. Thank you. Well, one of the programs that the police department offers that I think is an outstanding way to get across to our citizens what our police department really does, believe it or not, are the visits that our officers make to elementary schools. Now, many of us remember years ago Sheriff Donovan and his dogs that came to our <laughs> elementary schools and they would show off the yourself. <laughs> exactly. I know I'm beating myself, uh, but it's true, and that that helped us at a very young age begin to gain respect for the police department and what they were trying to do to make sure that we felt safe. Well, our police department's been doing that for quite some time, as a matter of fact, uh, and uh, the the whole danger. Uh, what's that? What's that term, danger? Oh, danger, strain, stranger, danger, stranger, 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 yeah. danger, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all part of that. Uh, so they've been working diligently 
with young people because that's really at that age is when they begin to establish their feelings about public safety and, and, uh, and public service. So that's one of the things I'm really proud of besides the other ones that, that were mentioned. One of the questions that we received that I don't believe we have on the screen was to the effect, are we seeing less of that because police are more concerned about liability, potential you know, misconduct accusations? Are they still interacting with the community in a level that builds those relationships? Well, we have police officers that go to neighborhood association meetings. They go to partnership meetings. Uh, we have uh, 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 resource officers in the high schools. Uh, I think we're much more active than a lot of people realize. And I believe the report back will show that whether they're going to be even more active in, in the local communities as well. And I think, again, in a community our size, again, we ought to be able to develop best practices. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a manageable, or should be, again, mm -hmm. a manageable situation. And I certainly have to echo the mayor uh, with individuals with uh, developing respect for the police. Mm -hmm. And the police have to develop respect for people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's a two-way street. They aren't somehow you know, above us, oh, you know, they're, they're with us. Three, three, I'm old three. enough to remember when, again, they believed protect and serve. Three. They were community servants, not community tyrants. Do you think the churches could do a better job of helping out with that? Well, certainly, we always can. I, um, I again, I, I put some skin in the game. Remember, I, I stopped eating for 40 <laughs> days uh, when we were having those record homicides. Mm -hmm. uh, and so faith works. Uh, there's no two ways about it, and I think that COVID has shown us that, again, we uh, uh, have to expand the word sanctuary mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to really community. And there are congregations in our community, both black and white, uh, that have been trying to work even before George Floyd mm -hmm. in a protective uh, and cooperative kind of way. But in this city of churches, right. clearly, we can do better and should do better. And community is not a one-way street. It's not just driven from the halls of the city. It is the entire community. We all have to work together collectively to make sure that we continue to be a wonderful city to live and work in. And again, echoing what you said, I have to respect the police force and the police force has to respect me as well. You know, it's a two way, all of this goes both ways. Sheriff Gladio, uh, a question. The, the mayor launched this you know, commission with the help of the councilwoman uh, and many others. How have you, uh, tried to improve, I guess, transparency uh, in the last year? Transparency with regards to? Policing and, and things that, that your agency does. Um, <laughs> I don't know that we're not transparent. I don't know if that's, but uh, with regards to some of the things that he just mentioned with the programs and the school resource officers and things like that, we're, we're out there probably three times more than we were before I took office with regards to uh, community, uh, the, the community resource officers and the school resource officers. I know that uh, we've got, uh, I think, four northwest, three southwest, and three or four in, in uh, East Allen County schools now, where when that first started, it was just one in each, each group. And it, it's increased on uh, uh, by request from the schools. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I was shocked when, when the whole thing started and, and Homestead High School approached us first years ago. And then when they asked for a dog, I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. And it's that one kind of came out of left field. And they embraced it, uh, both Northwest and Southwest. They had contests to name the dog. You know, they bought the dog. It, so I really think the communities out there, I, I really do believe they're starting to come around, and so are we collectively. Um, I think things are changing. It's not all doom and gloom, I don't think, right now. Uh, I think things have gotten better. I think we've learned some things from, from last summer, for sure. Such as? Again, how to, how to approach. Uh, you know, I stood, sat right here and admitted that Let's pull the cars away from the building. Let's not sh let's not show the uh, guys in our riot gear, uh, and and it worked. I, you know, we're talking about a one-year anniversary over two nights uh, of bad nights. 
that I don't want to relive, and I don't think anybody sitting up here wants to relive for sure. Um, we're fortunate. We're very fortunate. I mean, I think uh, Portland's still burning itself down. Uh, you know, thank the Lord we're not we're not involved in anything like that around here. Um, when I said I was proud uh, of the the protesters from I don't remember when they started noon to three, I was proud of them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they did a great job. Was it noon to three? Something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Saturday. Uh, yeah. yeah, and okay. and uh, then it just. Unfortunately, some bad people showed up and stirred the crowd. And I, uh, again, I, I digress, but I uh, keep hitting that same thing. But um, to answer your question, we are transparent. Um, and, and to the, the, the young man that was just there on the, on the video, if he, if he wants to contact the, the police department, I'm sure they would entertain a direct phone call. My number is uh, in, in, in the book. If there is such a thing as a book anymore, <laughs> no, I, no, I, I dated right. myself. <laughs> Sorry. We don't get phone books anymore. Do we? All right. no. But uh, so, yeah, we're there. Uh, I'll take calls anytime. Sure, Gladio, thank you. Let's take a moment now to go back to Chris. Yeah, just to, you know, I want to go to or spend too much time looking back on what happened a year ago. We, we had one follow up question uh, to that claim of people being from the outside disturbing what was happening here, and that is what can be done to keep out bad actors from some of those healthy protest things that are going on? That's a, that was a difficult, <laughs> difficult task yeah. when uh, we were in the mask, or you know, uh, people were masked up and you couldn't identify uh, anybody. Uh, you don't, it's not like they showed up with neon signs saying we're from out of town. So it was a difficult thing. We did the best we can with the intel. Um, we recognized them and identified them for the second night uh, for sure, uh, through through uh, video and uh, maybe not body cams at that time, but drones, we, we identified them, uh, and uh, that certainly helped. And I think it'll help in the future with body cams coming on board, and things like that. But you got to understand, it's a difficult thing to do when you're you're, look, you're staring down a street with 250 plus people. Um, how do you, how do you identify them and I think the prosecutor's office had a major problem with that which is totally understandable you know you 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 you, you take somebody into custody and are you you know the night's over with and three days later you're supposed to be able to say you can identify that person that's a difficult thing to do in the heat of the moment um, so I don't know if that was discussed in, 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 in uh, any meetings that I wasn't involved in but uh, maybe a procedural thing needs to change with regards to how to identify them and how to how to treat that situation. Well, I think one thing we can look at is that our systems, in a sense, are working right now. The mayor's commission was something he could do and Councilwoman Chambers could do. Uh, what our office did, we kept at it. We followed the rule of law. Uh, there were a lot of people that demanded things, and it was almost like a mob when it ruled by mob. And none of us succumbed to that, and we've tried to be positive and come up with good positive suggestions going forward. And I think that is, is critical for how we move, as Reverend McGill just said, where are we gonna be six months from now, a year from now? And, but we've done it right. Speaking so, of that, where we're gonna be six months from now, a right. year from now. Where, what type of significant progress would all of you all like to see a year from now? The commission is going full throttle. We have the recommendations in place. What would you like to see in a year? I would like to see the lessons that we learned. We as a city are in alignment at the state level. Laws were recently passed that are in alignment to efforts that we're making here at the city level, and we're in line with the federal level. I, there's an alignment happening. You know, we were just visionaries and got ahead of it and got in alignment city, state, and the feds. We're all in alignment. So what I would like to see is a shift in um, attitudes. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike just said mob rule, uh, sheriff, you know, aggressiveness. I just think that we got to get our lessons learned and how we deal and how we deal with people's pain and how they respond to painful situations. I would like for us to take a different approach and how we're, how we're going to respond to that. And I think that the Commission on Police Reform and Racial Justice is helping us get towards a different response. Well, if we work on that alignment, mm -hmm. and again, and maybe this is where the faith community and others uh, can play a role, is that we have a community that's more enlightened. Mm 
-hmm. at, at the end of the day because right. the let, let's not forget the riots, George Floyd, that was that's a symptom. Mm -hmm. The problem is the system at, at the end of the day. That that's what's really causing the problems at the end of the day. So it's shifting that way of thinking, mm -hmm. but shifting the way of acting and doing and being. And when we again can become, as Maya Angelo say, for right now, we're the yet to be United States of America. And we have to shift that needle. Other thoughts on that final question here? Or where you want to see us a year from now? It's hard to follow that. I, I, yeah, we went in the wrong order there. Yeah. I would just close with your title. It's the police and the community. The community. We have to, it's and. It's not separate. We work together. Working together, well said. I want to thank you all so much for joining us this evening and sharing your thoughts and engaging our viewers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. That hour went very quickly. We also want to thank you uh, for watching here and uh, wish you all a very good night. Thank you.